Welcome to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Hi, Joe. Hi, Pam. Pam, today we're going to talk about the opioid epidemic. And, you know, 300,000 Americans have died since the year 2000. And I'm sure we have listeners and viewers who've lost a loved one from this epidemic. Yeah. And there's this question about how we ended up in this position. Uh, what is it about the this round of the opioid crisis? I mean, I remember when we were growing up, the heroin crisis of the 1960s, and that seemed to die out. And now we find ourselves in this world where we have a new opioid crisis, this time starting with prescription drugs as opposed to pure street drugs. That's right. And I mean, one story I bet a lot of our listeners are familiar with, appeared in the New York Times. I also have another podcast, and we had Dr. Lemke from Stanford, who has a book, giving the, a similar story. Uh, is, yeah, the title of her book kind of conveys a lot. Is Drug Dealer MD. That's right. And it's a story about how one pharmaceutical company, uh, Purdue, uh, came up with a new version of the of uh, opioid, uh, 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 Oxycontin, and uh, build it as not that addicting, and kind of marketed the heck out of it, maybe with some sketchy support, and kind of convinced America's doctors that they were really under-treating pain and under-prescribing opioids, and that got us to where we are today. Yeah, which, no surprise, this being a show called Stanford Legal, is not just a medical crisis, but a legal issue as well coming out of that. And one of the great things about Stanford is our colleagues. We are so lucky with our colleagues, and we happen to have two people with us today who are just absolutely the right people to talk about the opioid crisis and the lawsuits that have come out of it. That's right. Uh, I want to introduce uh, our guest. We have Michelle Mello, is a professor of law and a professor of health research and policy at the School of Medicine. Uh, Michelle came to us a number of years ago. She is a, if not one of the leading authorities on health and the law, and recently uh, published an article entitled, Get This, Drug Companies Liability for the Opioid Epidemic. <laughs> Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Yeah, and Nora Freeman Engstrom is also a professor at the law school, and her specialty is tort law, lawsuits in which people who are injured sue someone seeking compensation for their injuries. And she, too, has been writing about the drug crisis and the liability issues that have come out of it. So thank you for being with us as well, Nora. Delighted to be here. Well, Nora and Michelle, take us to where the litigation is today. And maybe one way to look at it is when we think of someone suing, we think of someone suing. Uh, I have a loved one that died of opioid overdose. I've read these articles now about this drug company. I might sue that drug company. And can you start off just describing those suits to us? Sure. So some of those suits are being filed, which is to say I am an uh, opioid addicted person or I am the spouse, let's say, of someone who was opioid addicted and has passed away as a consequence of that addiction. Uh, so some of those individual suits are being filed and they're being filed uh, mostly right now against physicians. So the idea is you prescribed either for me or for my loved one uh, grossly excessive painkillers. You know, they had a little back pain. You prescribed uh, too high of a dose of a pill. You prescribed excessive pills. Then, or maybe you didn't monitor either, you know, the patient uh, to see that the patient was becoming addicted or dependent on drugs. Uh, that would be medical malpractice if a physician did that. And we're seeing some of those medical malpractice cases uh, coming to the courts and plaintiffs successfully recovering for those claims of medical malpractice. It's now becoming clear there's a recent court opinion that makes it really clear that physicians, you can't just take out that prescription pad and write a blank check, right? You need to be very careful in what you're prescribing your patients. And I would guess that we're going to see more of those kind of cases going forward. So let me ask you, so the doctor prescribes too much in the way of pain medication. Why did he prescribe too much of it? I mean, can the doctor turn around and sue Purdue Pharma for telling him, this isn't, this isn't habit forming or this is the right dose? 
So the overprescribing uh, really has its roots in a couple of things. One is the representations made by companies about their products and what is considered a safe dose, both in terms of the immediate toxicity to the patient and the long-term risk of opioid dependence. And we now know that Purdue and others grossly understated those risks, um, relied, as Nora said, on very thin evidence, in some cases suppressed evidence, um, suggesting that dependence was a real possibility. So the having been the target of these marketing messages for now going on 20 years is one source. But there's another current in all of this, which is within the medical profession um, and more broadly in the health policy community, and that's recognition that historically pain has really been undertreated in this country, particularly chronic pain, that those patients have been dismissed and their pain minimized for a long time. So the moment was right within the profession's sociology for these companies to come on the scene with their marketing messages. There was a report by what was then known as the Institute of Medicine, our country's leading independent source of medical advice saying there needed to be more aggressive treatment of chronic pain. So it was the confluence of this receptivity coming from within the profession from a a quite benign impulse to do better for patients and uh, the marketing messages by the companies. So that, as you say, Pam, raises a question of, well, now do we turn around and hold these companies accountable? And that, of course, is the second strand of the litigation that we're now seeing. And Oh, excuse me, Nora, you're about to... Well, there, there actually, even this week, there's been a lawsuit filed in Ohio where an Ohio hospital is suing exactly as Michelle says, which is to say, you know, you were misleading our physicians uh, about uh, the the toxicity of these drugs, uh, just how uh, addictive they are and, and seeking damages for exactly that conduct. How does it do these old-fashioned, because we're going to go on to a new kind of litigation that Michelle just averted to, how do these cases play out with the the plaintiff? I imagine if I'm a juror, I might think, you lied to get these drugs, you're an addict, maybe you've got a history of abusing other drugs. Does it matter a lot how sympathetic these individuals come across? Do they win the cases? Do they lose them? Uh, we don't know, uh, you know, have enough data on the opioid plaintiffs, and you know, specifically to be able to yeah. say that. But certainly, we know, and this is a cold fact about tort litigation in general, which is sympathetic plaintiffs tend to do better than unsympathetic plaintiffs. Um, you know, the likable, the the kind of approachable plaintiff um, who has a clean record, who you know seems like someone you know that would be the the teacher at your kid's school or the fellow soccer mom on the playground. Uh, those plaintiffs tend to do better in our tort system. So one one thing that I kind of wonder about is, given what you said, Michelle, about the undertreatment of pain, is, is there something doctors should have been doing differently? That is, when we talk about malpractice, you kind of assume there's something you could have done that would have been better. Are there drugs out there that, for example, have gone generic so they're not as profitable that the doctors could have prescribed? Is there some kind of protocol for how they should have dealt with the opioids that they didn't follow? Or is this one of these kind of areas where there's just a choice between two really bad outcomes? I think it, in retrospect, there's a lot that could have been done differently and should have been done differently. Starting with choice of drug, um, non anti-inflammatory therapy is going to be effective for a lot of types of pain and is, for many physicians, not the first-line therapy anymore or was not for a long time. That's stuff like naproxen? Yeah, you know, you know just yeah. you know, the kind of thing you might take at home will work in higher doses for people, particularly with acute injuries, post-surgery, and so forth. Second is supply. So, uh, you know, anyone who has had a baby in the United States in the last 10 years um, have, has probably had the experience of being sent home with 30 days worth of hydrocodone uh, after a C-section when three or five days is probably the right amount for most patients. Uh, but you can get some very mixed messages when you're sent home with a very long-term prescription like that. You know, that has changed completely just within the last year. Um, and then finally, as Nora averts to in this uh, decision uh, involving the um, back pain plaintiff, monitoring, you know, putting patients who are on, who are going to be on opioids for longer than the five-day period that we know is a critical window for dependents to form on a monitoring plan and, and re-prescribing at regular intervals after checking on how they're doing. This is Stanford Legal. And today we're talking with Michelle Mello and Nora Freeman Engstrom about the opioid crisis and the litigation that's followed. Michelle, you just said something I want to highlight. 
a three to five day window for dependents to form. So I have an operation. I'm prescribed some pain medication. You're saying I could become an addict in three to five days. I think the emerging evidence is showing that if you're on it for longer than three or five days, the risk of long-term dependence is greatly elevated. Wow. Just don't have any more operations, Joe. I'm, cu- I'm cutting back on them. No Pam. more bike accidents. <laughs> uh, uh, let's go to something that you're both knowledgeable on now. And Michelle, you've written about it. It's a new wave of litigation. It's not the case that it's only the victims or their family that's suing. What's happening today? Right. So in the past few years, roughly 400 states, municipalities, and counties have sued uh, drug manufacturers, distributors, and retail pharmacies uh, over the opioid epidemic. And what these uh, governmental entities are saying, essentially, is you've made our job harder by making our citizens addicted to these pain pills, which is to say it's way more expensive to run the foster care system, to run schools, to run the local hospital, to run local you know, EMS services, when we've got a population that's all addicted to pain pills. And so we are basically our price tag has gone way up and we want you which is to say you drug distributors, you manufacturers, you retail pharmacies that have profited uh, from this epidemic, we want you to foot the bill. Can can I just jump in here and ask you a question about the idea of suing, the government suing and saying you've made our job more expensive. I mean, they they don't sue McDonald's saying you've made our population fatter and we all know that obesity is a major health crisis in the United States. Uh, so, you know, our, ki- our kids need more physical education. Our hospitals are dealing with more, you know, overweight people. Our, you know, our workforce is less productive because they're all having coroners. Is there something different about drugs that makes, it, it makes these lawsuits make more sense when they're suing the drug companies than suing – those folks are suing car manufacturers because, you know, accidents on the road? Well, I don't think there's anything distinctive about drugs. I think there's something distinctive about obesity that makes it an especially hard problem to attack with litigation. Um, and, and one issue is just that we're not, of course, talking about one or a small group of products, but virtually everything that we consume <laughs> contributing to that. Just sue Whole Foods. Uh, <laughs> But uh, there, there is a lot of other uh, precedent for this type of action, starting, of course, with tobacco, but extending to lead paint, lots of other products that have generated what we might think of as a public nuisance for states, um, not only in the ways that Nora mentions, but perhaps most importantly for opioids for state Medicaid programs that have to treat these people. So this is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking about the opioid crisis and the litigation that's followed it with our colleagues Michelle Mello and Nora Freeman Engstrom. Uh, Michelle or Nora, can you give us a sense of the money involved? I mean, we talked about three hundred thousand lives. That's we 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 can't cost that at least in a meaningful way, maybe. But how about the profits? How much of how much of these companies made? So it's about a thirteen billion dollar a year industry. So big. Um, and on the distributor side, it really is dominated by just a couple very large companies, McKesson and Cardinal Health. So there are some very big players out there. In terms of what we might expect from the litigation, you know, to put it on the scale of the tobacco litigation, that was more than a two hundred billion dollar settlement. So far for opioids, it's been relatively modest. But there was one two thousand and seven settlement in a federal case against Purdue for two hundred million plus. $34 million paid by the executives themselves. There was another $150 million settlement against um, McKesson in 2017 um, and lots of smaller cases. So there's some real money that has already been on the table. The question is, you know, for public health experts who would like to see litigation as an avenue for actually addressing the behavior of a company, would the settlement be large enough to really incentivize a company that has made so much money off its products? On the other hand, you know, the market for its products is contracting at the same time that this litigation is going on. Uh, so that combination of push and pull may mean that even a smaller settlement than we would seen in, say, tobacco could have a big, big economic pinch. 
And also, I'd say that the the federal judge who is overseeing the lion's share of this litigation, who's a judge out of Cleveland, Ohio, Judge Polster, he's made it clear that he doesn't, with the settlement, want to, quote, move money around, unquote, which is not to say there won't be money changing hands here. Absolutely, there will be. Uh, And as Michelle says, I think we will expect to see, you know, billions of dollars moving around at the conclusion of this litigation if it's brought to a successful conclusion. But he's also made it clear in his words, quote, what we've got to do is dramatically reduce the number of pills that are out there and make sure that the pills that are out there are being used properly. Uh, so it's not enough, he, he suggests at the end of this case, to just have you know one check going from one party to another. He wants to change the structures in place uh, that really tame the opioid epidemic. And if you were changing those structures as a public health person, what would you do? Well, I think uh, obviously it has to be multifactorial. There is a lot of work going on already, as we've talked about, within the medical profession to change practices on the prescribing. And that's clearly going to be key in staunching the flow of new users into dependence. Um, On the distribution front, there is much, much more that has to be done to monitor where shipments are going in real time to understand when they are being diverted to pill mills, um, when they're going, uh, you know, when a vast amount of drug is flowing into a small locality that couldn't possibly have a need for it. The distributors have been very lax on that front. And with today's electronic health records and other technologies, it it shouldn't be difficult to track those shipments. Yeah, because I think with tobacco, there were these showings, for example, this had to do more with the tax part of tobacco than anything else, that there would be, you know, 700 cartons of cigarettes per person on an Indian reservation being right. sent to the reservation. So you knew that stuff was right. being diverted into some other market. Right. Is the same thing happening with the pills? Yes, it has. Absolutely. Um, and then the third ang- the third angle is the illicit market. You know, part of um, the difficulty with this particular epidemic is that people start with prescribed drugs, but as those prescribed drugs become more and more difficult to procure, they switch then to black markets. And with the um, influx of very, very cheap, highly lethal fentanyl from South America. It's just very, very easy for users to um, begin uh, and sustain a dependence through that means. Can I ask you a torts question about that, Nora, which is um, somebody starts with prescribed Oxycontin, but ends up buying fentanyl on the, uh, you know, on the street market and dies from that. Can they sue their doctor because the doctor started them down this path? Can they sue Purdue because Purdue manufactured the first drug they took, even though the drug that actually killed them wasn't? the drug that they were prescribed? I think those cases get much harder. We haven't seen a lot of that litigation and, and you know, the legal concepts of proximate cause are going to come in here. Uh, we usually say in tort law uh, for a plaintiff to pin liability on the defendant, they have to show a number of things and part, one ingredient kind of in that stew of liability is what we call proximate cause. And that's a relatively clear link uh, between the defendant's conduct and the plaintiff's injury. Here, the defendant certainly would stand up and, and, and you know, jump up and down and say, you know, here there wasn't a clear link. You know, it was this decision uh, to go off and procure this illegal drug, which is what uh, contributed to the injury. Also here, of course, we have we have another legal doctrine called contributory negligence or comparative negligence. Uh, The drug manufacturer would again jump up and down and say, you know what, maybe we're a little bit at fault or, or, you know, maybe we did something a little bit wrong. But the plaintiff is really the one who erred here in making that decision to not just engage in negligent conduct, but actually illegal conduct, uh, and that ought to defeat its claim, the plaintiff's claim for liability. So it would certainly be an uphill road. And that's a that's a common thing in tort. So for our listeners, if there are bad things in the air and your son has a terrible case of asthma, we might know as a public health matter that X company is contributing those bad things. But all these issues are going to interfere with bringing a suit against that company if there are other companies that are also polluting the air. Absolutely. We'll be back with more from our guests, Nora Freeman Engstrom and Michelle Mello, talking about the opioid crisis next on Stanford Legal on Sirius XM Insight 121.